Mark Bamuthi Joseph identifies as an arts activist, spoken word artist, and a librettist. He is a remarkable and award-winning performer, arts educator, and curator who seamlessly and powerfully weaves together various artistic disciplines, community engagement strategies, which he's also facilitating this topic during our breakout session in the afternoon, and his creative endeavors are always in pursuit of social justice. Please welcome Mark Bumuthi Joseph. consciousness 
that was sensitive to both global environment and the urgency of system-induced pathologies, the ever-present shadow of both the educational and nutritional industrial complexes. The idea and the desire were there, though, and the Doors Duke Charitable Fund gave us the resources to pursue a model to attack this critical point of inquiry. We responded with two decisive actions. Um, the first was an organizing model um, and then a branded strategy, and we spent two years implementing them both in four cities across the United States. So the first thing that we did was we changed the name of our event from the Red, Black, and Green Environmental Caucus and Concert. <laughs> like this living. <laughs> yeah. uh, the logic is that the word green, as previously suggested, comes with its own set of assumptions, immediate cultural history, pop cultural association with affluence. So rather than maintain green as a primary value, as an indicator um, of where the community should go, we inserted life as a primary value, as an indicator of some place where we already were. Uh, the second impactful change was the evolution of our organizing strategy from a single organization, single curator um, strategy to a multiplayer interdisciplinary network. We took the capitalist practice of constructing critical adjacencies to add value to space to create a co-op of ideas and execution that we call the creative ecosystem. Um, the retail model looks like this. A uh, developer A builds a Safeway on the corner of 51st and Broadway in Oakland. The Safeway becomes an even more attractive destination when you put a Payless shoe store next to it. And then you add a Starbucks, a CVS, like that. So in this way, an artificial community is, based, um, is created based on diverse consumption and proximity. Yeah. Among these entities, the shared value is the amassment of profit, though they have different methods of building wealth. Um, life is living applies similar logic, but instead of real estate, community is constructed on an art and pedagogy-based cornerstone. And instead of financial profit um, at the center of these partnerships or adjacencies, the partners, led by youth speaks, um, place one critical issue at center, which is life. Um, we ask hundreds of leaders, what sustains life in your community? The question, what sustains life? your community. The answers were sometimes rooted in environmental sustainability, but depending on where we were, they often veered towards the colloquial and the absurd. So Frenchie's Chicken Shack sustains life in Houston, just like Beyonce does. Um, City Slicker Farm sustains life in Oakland, like Urban Relief does. B-Boys sustain life in New York City, like the Sustainable South Bronx does. Um, the composite responses become the foundation for life is living, and like the retail model, it involves a shared value and a plurality of methodologies, but this is a model built on relationships. Um, my partners at Youth Speaks had to concede that we were excellent at drawing crowds and producing art, but it was disingenuous to claim to be an eco-agency when that wasn't our area of expertise. So instead, we fell back on the two pillars of our mission statement. Um, we create safe space, and we perform interdisciplinary collaboration. So we shifted from placing the event at the center to placing the varied relationships at the center of our work. So very simply, in addition to local and touring repertory work or visual arts projects, educational programming, and online life, um, you Speak's most successful modality is its function as the hub of a localized interdisciplinary network, um, one that meets monthly, shares ideas, builds community, produces shared space in which to make collective ideas manifest. So um, here's the thing about this social incubator. Its function is to model what black joy might look like at scale. Besides hip hop itself, Black Lives Matter is the longest sustained grassroots movement of note in my lifetime. Ironically, what sustains the movement is not necessarily the black people themselves as much as the fact that cops or vigilantes keep killing unarmed black people. So even if folks wanted to mute the campaign, they couldn't because Walter Scott is getting shot in the back 
where Sam Ambrose is getting shot in his car, where nine people are being annihilated in the house they came to pray in. The movement is a place of mourning. And it is sometimes full of rage and has also been the site of paramilitary opposition. So you can understand the edge in this time of drought. You can sense the extra parched thirst for wet justice to come rolling down. So what is the visual score for this stress? Consider the theater of grainy camera phones pointed at Oscar Grant or grainy audio picking up the distant sound of Trayvon Martin's final moments. And the alternative iconography comes from where? Rap. Ask yourself, what is the normalized view of black people as a mass? Not a few people in your workplace. I'd submit that in the American imagination, black people don't tend to aggregate in places of success. See us imagined by America in mass, and the landscape might be poverty or jail and at best church. So artistically speaking, the most worthy thing I might do right now is place black joy among the white noise and make something beautiful and participatory so that we might consider black life in public space in a frame other than rage or grief. These are images. <laughs> Images from my project for Creative Time, um, which is one of the country's uh, foremost curators of public art. I'm aware that the team there, including the new director of the Brooklyn Museum and Pastor Matt, knew about uh, my strategies for facilitating life as living and the urban creative ecosystem, so um, they invited me to make a work of scale in New York. This spring, about 100,000 people encountered this exhibition in such a park. Um, joining 12 collaborators, including the incredible Brent Cook, who designed and executed the visual centerpiece of our work, I made a refracted, self-repairing second line called Black Joy in the Hour of Chaos. As inspiration, the score considers reframing the matter of black life through the lenses of joy, passing, and migration. Asks, can we expose the border politics of black music in a northward bound morning? What did our grandmothers leave behind that would be pretty handy right now? Says, we're going to describe a particular ecstasy to you. Kids like Trayvon or Jordan or Mike or Oscar would have trouble finding the words we're using, but no difficulty finding the feeling. As part of the process, we held Black Joy salons with several Harlem-based institutions, including the nurses of Harlem Hospital, the programming body and constituents of El Museo, the shopkeepers of La Casa Azul, the curatorial team of Harlem Stage. It may seem obvious to you, but here's why Black Joy is worth it. Glory to the kid on the other side of the scope. The cop ain't shooting at you. He's aiming at a trope. He's got a blind spot in his privileges shaped exactly like him. He's been training by naming large mountains after small men, paying no attention when the leaves change, when the leaves fall, when it freezes over, when the season frees us all. Somber is the sober of full lip smile and spring awakening. Joy is a human right. Spring is for the taking in. Melanin baking in the solstice shifting framing of the sable skin. Black satin stunning, stunning beauty, a culture of the songs of dislocation, a people of the water singing to me. Sing of joy right now before my small boy becomes scary while he's still able to tell the dancer's story without using his body. Before he masters social forms in an age of technological norms, before his default position is white male active voice. Listen, child, it is likely that the black psyche is a ventriloquist for American aggression, a territory for transgression in these last flush days of Canada. These murdered boys are cultural events. 
scripts for the performance of outrage. Hooded plot, left to rot for hours in blood on the asphalt fields where they're shot. So I sing of salt and moan, of brown and blue, of wanting one more day to get it right, of joy in the living black body and how that matters, the matter of the beating heart, the factor sacrosanct in the scars a soul carves in heaven's palms as it walks earth in heaven's shell, skin the color of the other side of the stars, dark like the dawn that swallowed Jean Bell. In acceptance of our most excessive expectation, in expectation that our highest selves will prevail, I seek to make joy material, to let the ceremony begin, to let the sacks unmask the task of healing, open fists to lift the unquenched thirst for grieving. In the wind, a word winds itself into the drawl of a blind whim, open, vibrant, half of a prayer, an arctic blast of free at last, cast in the case of living joy, while black. So, how do we move from black joy So the question, how do we move from black joy, which is itinerant, how do we move from black joy, which is itinerant, to black autonomy, which is political? Can we imagine the artistic curation of community activation? Is it possible to pedagogically choreograph social justice? Dang. <laughs> <laughs> The things that keep me up at night. <laughs> Is it possible to pedagogically choreograph social justice? Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> but I will ask you to imagine a scenario with me. To imagine a pathway from art practice to policy. So um, I want to start with my friend, Theaster Gates. Uh, you're about to hear him um, speak at a rehearsal, at a workshop presentation of um, uh, a piece called Red, Black, and Green of Blues. This is the essay. <laughs> My investment in dance or song. My investment in a studio project, a studio practice. Starts with believing that materials have redemptive quality. That poor places have redemptive qualities. That someone has to believe in the poor. So I've come to adopt a politic of state. A politic of like, instead of moving when I could, when I make a little bit more money, what happens if I stay? And I use those extra resources to do something close. For people not just like me class-wise. The people who uh, were like my parents. Who were also maids. Who were also cab drivers. Who were also factory workers. What happens if we all leave? That this is an art practice about believing. A design practice of believing. A dance practice of believing. A studio practice of believing. Believing is architecture. 
Believing is urban planning. Believing is engagement. Believing is breathing.
or some kids from your local body, or some MacArthur winning choreographer from Beijing, and you're crazy inspired, and you're in the proximity of others who are similarly inspired, and you bless. You know, what then? So at YBCA, I collaborate with a team that thinks about taking that moment of inspiration and that community of activated folks and transposing them in time to a year before the show. My work is to identify creative communities and cultivate them based not on an artist's presentation of an idea, but at the root of the inquiry that inspired the art itself. My job is to make social incubators for creative change. So imagine the life cycle of a question. Think of a creative inquiry as you would think of a seed. Think of the question as a building block of urban architecture nurtured by an artist from idea to civic blossom. Most creative inquiries in our contemporary environment meet an economic, social, or technological end. The draft of our musics are so often informed by the market-driven incubators that harbor them. As such, the life cycle of creative questions um, tend to end in a consumable product molded in the form that a parent company needs to sustain or advance its market share. But consider the life cycle of a question as nurtured by a cultural incubator, a resource networked institution that provides safe and provocative harbor for leading edge creative souls to guide a question from nascent form to public impact. YBCA asks itself, can we design a social practice built on the instigations of a curated few? Can we manage the life cycle of an idea build an ecosystem of creative individuals to respond to that idea, nurture those responses with artistic interactions, and then harvest the results in the form of public policy? It's a hard question. Consider the life cycle of the law. Imagine it cynically and insinuate that few ideas become law nowadays without first being tampered with by money that said, perhaps the only thing more powerful than private funds is public will. When my institution describes its mission as generating culture that moves people, the bet that we're making is that we can activate how art influences the public imagination, and we can design a process whereby highly dynamic inquiry spawns culture, and culture precedes policy. So our new curatorial design begins with the belief that social change begins with the artists that are asking the right catalytic questions, and we can organize our community to refine, reframe, and respond to those questions in a way that can seduce the public will. So uh, my title, Chief of Program and Pedagogy, this is what happens when poets name themselves. <laughs> you know, when I'm on a plane, folks are like, what are you doing? I'm like, an artist. <laughs> um, but you know, colleagues are like, you know, chill, really. Um, but I, you, you know, my confession is that, um, you know, my first gig out of, uh, out of college, I taught at a, um, at a high school, 10th graders. And um, I'm still applying the logic of the high school English teacher, one of the best high school English teachers you've ever had, hopefully, to um, how I think about um, curation. So um, I think about the season like a professor would think about a syllabus and organize not just um, a season in terms of artists who I think will um, um, impress or inspire audiences, but um, think about how we deploy artists in a curricular way. So I think about this in six parts. Um, the first um, begins with um, the staff, the members, and the board of the Rebuena Center for the Arts. I ask everybody to nominate and finalize um, a list of culture makers that we call the YBCA 100. The first part of our process is um, the distilled, is instigation, the distilled questions of 100 folks from 
around the planet. Um, Carrie Mae Weems, or Theaster Gates, or Khalik Allah, or Juno Diaz, or Carol Walker, or Noah Budney, who's the, um, the creative director of the San Francisco um, Bicycle Coalition, or Anthony Minn, who is a founding chef and restaurateur at um, Mission Street Foods. And we bring these folks together, this YBCA 100, and we ask them each to um, share with us what are the questions that are driving them in the moment. We then use these questions to organize the rest of our curatorial impulses. And one of the ways that that happens is, um, is through what we call our, um, our working groups, our community think tanks, our creative ecosystems. Right? So by taking the questions of the YBCA 100, um, we then ask staff to name the folks that are inspiring them the most locally that they believe can actively um, respond to the questions on the table. So again, think about, I don't know, this audience. And, if, um, and think about like, you know, the best workshops where everybody just kind of comes down in a small working group. So if I can take this audience and divide you in five different working groups based on the questions of um, 100 different artists, what could we accomplish? <coughs> um, you know, it's, um, it's important to note that these um, community think tanks, they come from all over the place. You know, they're in the sphere, I would say, of folks that work at YBCA, but um, the guy who's, um, Back is Tubi, that's Dwayne Dieterville. He's um, a scholar at UC Berkeley. Um, the dude in the black shirt, his name is Kamel Bell. He's um, a local promoter if the roots come into town or if Kendrick Lamar is performing at the, um, at the Fox Theater in Oakland. That's the guy you know, that's um, producing the show. Um, that's Freddie Anzuras in the denim jacket on the far left. If anybody has an iPhone, when you like slide your little slider thing on your home screen, you know, like your phone is locked and you slide the thing over. That sound that you hear, that's the sound of Freddie's high school locker coming in. <laughs> um, yeah, this is uh, Jova and Jay Marie and Raphael and my girl Dream Hampton, activists, students, mathematicians, filmmakers. Um, you know, like Kelly Famous, Dream Hampton is Jay Z's biographer. Um, Raphael is um, a, a math teacher at Castlemont High School in East Oakland. Yeah, the point is, is that um, we go within our community and ask them to respond to big questions. Yeah. Um, the, the third thing that we do, the third step in this process, is we bring these communities together to um, see the art that we're going to curate. Right? So um, we, temper, um, we temper the inquiry or we temper their responses by um, intentionally placing certain art pieces in their way. I think this is important to say because um, we don't stop the job of curating an awesome season. Degenerate Art Ensemble, you know, um, Seattle-based choreographers, winners of um, the Creative um, Capital Award not too long ago. They're on the cover of City Arts Magazine in Seattle right now. Um, this is um, a show that um, one of our creative ecosystems, one of our community think tanks will um, engage together. Boots Riley, one of my favorite hip hop artists, we created something in the YBCA forum called The Shadow Box. This was another show that um, all of our folks, that a, a second group saw it together. Kyle Abraham, the first meeting of um, the community think tank that was focused on the design of the urban future, the first thing that they did was they saw Kyle Abraham's pavement together. So the idea is we throw big questions out, we bring people together to respond to those big questions, and um, we make sure that our art, the, the art that we love and the artists that we love are part of the curricular frame for how they respond to these big questions. Um, the next step in the process is we ask um, these folks to publicly prototype in our space um, um, what those responses might look like, right? So, um, for instance, we had Young Jean Lee um, propose to us. Um, she asked the question, what is on the other side of my body's joy? 
and what's on the other side of my body's shame. So we brought people together in our body politics, body politic community think tank to um, kind of delve in and move through those questions. And part of the results are this. This is Candace <coughs> Antique Wicks. This is Tommy Shepard. They created a song cycle based on the history of black shame. This is Dania Cabello, uh, one of my uh, favorite footballistas. She's a native of Chile. She played on the UC Berkeley's um, women's soccer team. Um, she, in response to the question of what is on the other side of my body's joy, um, created a whole um, soccer workshop outside of our theater. <laughs> So here's where it gets difficult. Um, following, um, following these public responses, um, we have to find a way to channel these responses into the public imagination in a scaled way. So um, this doesn't happen a lot, but sometimes it looks like this. Denise Jolly, who is another alum of the body politics think tank, who um, took these understandings of what it means to be beautiful, the, the various um, encounters that she had with size and shame and beauty, and she said, you know, fuck it, I'm gonna be my beautiful self in really public spaces across America. So this is um, scantily clad Denise in the middle of Grand Central Station. <laughs> Um, this is another example of what it is to, to prototype responses in the public realm. This is um, one. Um, this is a prototype of a six-sided ping pong table that we set up on Market Street. Right again, in response to the question of the urban future. So, um, if you follow the trail, we begin with inquiry. We bring people together to respond to an idea. Um, we ask those people to create performative or physical or object-based responses to those questions. Um, we prototype them in public space. And then, if we're lucky, there is policy or manifestation or cultural practice. If culture precedes policy, this cycle of asking, refining, prototyping, and celebrating begins to take root in the public will. It impacts public, public and private partnerships and eventually inspires shifts in local law. So what does that look like? I don't know. I don't, I have no idea. But I can't imagine. So yes, as an art center, we bring together activists, philanthropists, artists, technologists, and humanitarians. But who we curate for um, our stages is based on the belief that the burning questions that these people are asking are the fertile ground for the world that we want to make. We are inviting our multiple publics to refine the questions of these instigators, to essentialize them down to digestible and publicly actionable components, to join us in our building and around our region in a shared exercise of art-framed civic progress. We reimagine ourselves as activist citizens. We think of our brick and mortar home as public square for debate and aspiration and choose some of, the, some of the most inspired among us to use their questions like stars over an ocean of possibility, setting our course of discovery toward a brave and compassionate future and an axis between capitalist productivity and academic curiosity, an intentional community design that projects a more soulful destination for its identity. Um, it begins not with art, but with transformation, a nod to social alchemy, an accountability matrix that advances a specific, inclusive, aesthetically driven commitment to the world as it might be. The advancement of unpoliced beliefs, cresting through dance, shadow, drag, sound, martial art, white noise, living word, standing with a rooted sense of social mission. We imagine an inquiry-driven process that grounds a common consciousness and demands of all who witness the action item of reaching toward the ideas, bodies, images, and sounds 
hovering just above the plain old every day, like last night's dreams, or tomorrow's celebrations, or tomorrow's democracies, or the surprising gift of art that makes us present.